represent how women are not just being impacted by climate change but fighting against it. Um, we've got the uh, there's the spectrum from uh, Tina Rothery who's um, campaigning has been all about like, lo local and community resistance to fracking and Alison Doig from Christian, Christian Aid who has the whole sort of global perspective <laughs> on women so I think I, I think it's a great um, opportunity uh, which one of you two were going to go first? Cool. So yeah I'm Alison, hi um, and I'm also a Unite member so I'm definitely a, a union supporter. So I've been uh, leading uh, Christian Aid's advocacy and policy work for almost 10 years now. Uh, I often say from, from Copenhagen, if you remember the climate negotiations in Copenhagen that would came out such a political disaster all the way to Paris and beyond, and we had success at Paris and beyond. So I've been leading the policy uh, analysis there. But recently I've just taken on head of policy and I've taken on also that means oversight for our gender and inequality work as well. So I've been having quite a rapid learning curve specifically on, on gender and it's been quite useful to look at the overlap between the two. So I thought I would, I will, I'll talk a little bit about three things. Um, I, I just wanted in this context of, of women in jobs and, and climate to talk, reflect about a little bit of my own experiences um, of how I got where I am um, as a reflection. Um, and then more focus, what I really want to focus on is, is the experience of women in developing countries in the climate context. Um, <laughs> and a little bit about their voice, bringing their voice into the climate debate um, nationally and internationally. So... I just thought, in terms of my own, how I got to be, you know, lead climate person and climate change, change at Christian Aid was I, um, I studied way, way back, studied mechanical engineering, and at the time, um, and actually I think still now, something like one in eight of the engineering students were women, I mean, across the board, and I don't think that's changed at all. I went on in the early 90s to do a PhD, and I moved into electrical engineering, in fact, the power systems department of the electrical engineering. Department. And again, about one in eight of the students and other groups, students and lecturers, were, were women. Our team had five women. Our team had five women looking at renewable energies for developing countries, not just developing countries, looking at renewable energies for people who were far from the grid in developing countries. So I went to India, I, worked, I studied at a university there for a year, went into the remote Himalayan mountains and looked at how hydropower could bring lighting and mechanical power to the people there. As did my, my colleagues in the department who went, did similar in Nepal, in Sri Lanka and Vietnam. I then from there moved on and went to University of Surrey and studied there, well, research, did, you know, did postdoctoral research there on in environmental impacts. I was in the Centre for Environmental Strategy, which was totally multidisciplinary. Um, so we had economists, we had geographers, sociologists, and we had three engineers, and again, all women. Uh, chemical engineer, civil engineer, mechanical engineer, <laughs> all women, all looking at the environmental impacts and looking at um, closed uh, cycle for, for materials and what have you. So not saying that, uh, my reflection, this is anecdotal, my reflection is I do often wonder in the engineering sector if instead of women having to fit into a male engineering structure, that actually more of women's approaches and expertise formed the way we did engineering and we, the way we developed our technologies in the future, whether actually, I mean this is a very personal reflection, but whether actually we would see quite different solutions in, the, in, yeah. in, in there. So I, I just thought in this context I, I, would, I would bring that in, but really what I want to do is focus on, often when I say I do climate change advocacy, I go to you know, the climate negotiations for Christian aid, people go, don't they do nice development projects over there? <laughs> Um, and yes, we do. We did fantastic projects um, around the world. And about 10 years ago, it was increasingly noticed um, that the weather was changing in, in East Africa. There was a lot more drought. When the rain came, it was much, much more heavy. In Bangladesh, the flooding was more frequently. And this is seawater that comes in, and seawater salinates the fields. In um, Southeast Asia and the Philippines, uh, that the typhoon season was getting stronger and stronger and stronger. In Bolivia, the glaciers are melting at a fantastic rate. I mean, it's scary looking at the pictures of the region. And the glaciers are what feed the agriculture. They also feed the mega cities of La Paz and, and Lima, who are already looking at, you know, can we divert the Amazon? Can we do this? Can we do that? Looking at ways of finding water for the cities. So we were looking at our projects around the world and realising, actually, this climate change is impacting the real people where they are. 
and that's where uh, it was just before I joined. Um, the head of programmes of the international programmes said, well, maybe we should investigate. And actually, at that time, we looked and we investigated, and, and most of the development groups who were just getting into climate change were doing, and we do as Christian Aid, we do development work, we help those people in, in Bolivia, we help the people, and we work with them on the ground. But in terms of our policy and advocacy work, we thought, well, we fight poverty, but we fight the cause of poverty, and actually, carbon emissions is causing a threat to, um, to the poverty reduction efforts. If we can't stop carbon, we can't, you know, our pro challenge of reducing and stopping poverty is uh, almost impossible. So we decided to focus a lot on carbon reductions and making sure carbon reduction was done in a fair way for poorer countries. But just to sort of reflect in terms of how we work with women, and it's interesting that women and men experience these pro problems on the ground, these, the flooding, the drought in different ways. Um, Interesting reflection actually on Typhoon Haiyan that hit the Philippines. Um, what happened in Haiyan was that the, there was a warning, they were fortunate to get a warning, so all the women and children left to safer ground, but the men stayed to sell the property. So the people who were killed were predominantly men, which is you know, absolute tragedy, but you then have women with children coming back. So they are going to have to rebuild their lives as single women or women headed households. So where's your development approach? Your development approach has to start with those women mm -hmm. at the centre. I and mean, that's quite unusual, actually. Most disasters hit women harder. The other thing is when... Um, the, there are lots of other examples, but there's other examples where across the developing world, for example, um, more than 50% are of, of small-scale farmers. Most farming is done across the globe by small-scale farmers. Most production of, of food crops is by small-scale farmers, and nearly half of them are women. And at the moment, most of the outreach, most of the advice, most of the work that's done on farming is with men. Only 5% of the women actually get any advice, partly because of illiteracy, but also because of taboos. It's men that's going out to do the extension work. So it's how do you actually work in a way that's going to reach those women to benefit them? And often, the women are the ones who have the seed banks. The women are the ones that know when to plant, when not to plant. and when you know. So it's actually how do you see them as part of the solution and bring them into that. Um, so we're approaching it in many ways. How do we um, work with these women to get their knowledge? We work to get with the Met Office um, to get text messages into these areas, to get weather data to the women, but also help them find their own solutions using their knowledge of their, of their own farming system, so it's, it's, it's working with them. Um, another way would be through, I mean, we, there's many ways, because we, we have different problems in different areas. Again, in the Philippines uh, and also Central America, we work on early warning systems in the big cities where flooding happens regularly. And again, working not only through women, but also through women's groups, you have an early warning system, you get the message out there, but once you've been told what you to do, you have to know where to go. How do you go to safety? Where do you where do you go? How do you get there without creating a traffic jam? So there's actually training and expansion through uh, different groups to to train people on where to go so that they're safe. How to make what their livelihoods as secure as they can so that when they go back, there's something to go back to. Um, so in terms of being part of it, one of the other things is that we don't just deal with and cope with the problem. That one, a lot of the areas is moving people into, uh, across the world, and looking at ways in which we can move into a thriving green economy. How do we actually get new, decent work in the south um, that is not doing all the problems that we did in the north, that's actually starting and developing a green economy? Um, and we did some work last year doing an assessment of, of women in that context. You know, women are often um, the recyclers. <coughs> litter pickers is the basic thing, but they're, they're involved in that side of things, or they're the ones involved with water carrying, or they're the ones involved with providing energy, whether it's through picking up wood, collecting charcoal, but cooking generally. So often they're involved in the natural resources that, that are involved in evolving a green economy. What was found though often is that when people say, oh we've got to develop this green economy, we've got to create a private sector company and bring in this mechanism and bring in that, you know, bring in something that's formal. They work in the for informal economy often, women, just getting money when and as they need and how, how, how they can. But um, when you formalise it, when you start to mechanise it, it becomes a man's job, very often. So the, the, the nature of employment changes. 
So instead of going in and sort of dumping a solution, that's all, it, it's really about how you work with those, those women to cooperate. How do they negotiate for better prices for what they do, better value for them? How do they form and evolve these better uh, health and safety standards, better you know, sort of conditions from themselves, rather than it all being top down? Um, so anyway, these are just some, I've got more examples when we, we come to chat if, if, of, of that type of green economy and how women can actually, and I think my, my real focus of this bit of, of the study is that, yes, women are massively impacted. Women are, are the majority of poor, poor people. People in extreme poverty and general poverty are women. Uh, the ones receiving most assistance are men. <laughs> I, I, it just is a fact because women are often marginalised, illiterate, kept, you know, sort of kept domestic rather than in the community. That there's different ways in which you reach them. It is, and, and but so they are often the hardest impacted. When they are impacted, it's harder for women often to recover. They can't leave home, or if they do leave home, they're then at risk. So there's a lot of dynamics going on that are very different. Not to say that men don't have problems in these situations, they definitely do, but they're a different set of... Therefore, you need to work both with men and with women to find the solutions. And my point is that the, they are victims, but they are also very, very much at the heart of the solutions. And they have to be there from the decision-making, <coughs> right from the start. They can't be just the, the beneficiary. Here are, here's your solution. It's got to be working with men and women to find solutions that, that for both. I just, um, a final thought, sort of bringing back to, so, whereas, um, that's very much about the work we do in the developing world, but a lot of what I, my day job is, or has been for the last 10 years, is, is how do we influence, that was at a national, local level, at a global level, how do we bring these experiences to the global negotiations? And um, so I, you know, I talk to the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, where climate and energy sits these days. Base. We go and we talk to them. We, we go to the UN meetings, but we don't go. We, we don't go alone. Particularly <coughs> international. We have worked. It was said that the Copenhagen of 2015 climate conference was a disaster. For Christian Aid and for our partners and our global partners, it was a massive success because we got more diversity of engagement. We got people from every continent, from the Pacific Islands, from Africa, from Asia, from Latin America, into the rooms and starting to talk. By the time we got to Paris, and it's not me bringing in, here's my friend who's got an experience or she's got an experience of hardship. It is people in suits, you know, they come and they, they are as much part of the negotiations as, as I am or my colleagues from London are. They're, they're very much talking to their government, bringing back intelligence so I can talk to our government. It's, it's very much a team that we work with in these situations. And we work really hard to together to build confidence to talk to governments, to be in the front line of the negotiations. And when we got to Paris... There were so many of us from so many different backgrounds. The government saw us watching. <laughs> they saw the world's media watching, but we were there talking to them every single day saying, why didn't you do that? And, and each of the governments in the G77 developing countries and the most vulnerable countries, we have staff partners that come and talk to them. And, and I am 100% certain that if we had not been there, the, the deal would have been stitched up in the back rooms. <laughs> um, it, it, it would have been. Like it was at Copenhagen, it was very much you know U.S., China, and um, a couple of others in the back room making a, a deal. This time it was very explicit, and every single country has now signed up, except for the U.S., who's pulled out. I mean, even, <laughs> even Syria and Saudi Arabia are part, and Russia are part of it. They, just the U.S. have, have pulled out, but we're we're not giving up hope. We, there is we're still in, which is the U.S. Um, company, companies, cities individuals saying we're still in and, and not giving up. I, I don't let Trump <laughs> get me down because I know so many people who are still are working really hard. That was a bit of a whirlwind. So um, it's really, as I say, my, my central message is that women are part of the solution. They have to be there right at the decision-making table. They have to be not just consulted but doing um, and to get these solutions working for everybody in the world, not for men and for women across the world. So um, I'll stop there. I think I've had my <coughs> 15 minutes. <laughs> well, I'm quite in awe because um, I love the part where you said that when you're seeking the solution, because the women have been left behind anyway, that if now you're going to seek solutions and maybe get them in at this point, in some ways it's probably going to be easier, I would have thought, rather than unlearning 
old ways, you can instill new ways. I think what we're acutely aware of where we are fighting fracking, but here in the safety, albeit a mock democracy, um, but at least we don't get shot for doing it. We don't get arrested for doing it. We do occasionally get brutalised by the police, but generally we have the ability to utilise our legal system in some ways to fight, and we have um, a pretense of civility um, from our state. However, the women that we fight with, and I think one of the things that surprised me most when I first found out about fracking back seven years ago was that our movement, I would say, is maybe 70% women, and it, it is across the world. And that a lot of those women are much older women as well, partly because of time restraints and the fact that we're more available once we've finished our child rearing, we've got grandchildren, but they've got mothers, so you can be <laughs> free a little bit. Uh, and then, of course, many of us too also have maybe the continued caring of older relatives and so on, which also makes it a little bit difficult at times. But one of the first ways I found out about fracking um, was I went and I did the research and I bumped into a story from the Utah midwives. And the Utah midwives were before a gagging order was put in place and they all lost their jobs. Um, each of them worked independently in Utah and was discovering that their, um, the women that they were caring for were suffering more in, at this point um, and either losing early term loss or birth abnormalities and difficulties with pregnancy, difficulties even trying to get pregnant. And they, they didn't necessarily link all this up because each was working individually. It wasn't until a funeral um, that they realised that the part of the cemetery where the babies were um, was much more fresh graves than there had ever been at any one time. And then the Utah midwives got together and they shared their data with each other to discover what is the similarity, what's causing this. Mm. And the only thing they could find that they all shared in common was that they were within five miles of a fracking site. They raised the alarm instantly and were instantly silenced as well. And gagging orders were put in place and the most vociferous of them were silenced completely to the point where they lost their jobs. Very little was done until I think it was a year or two later that the racehorse breeders in the area were experiencing birth abnormalities in the foals that are worth a fortune. And the chap who discovered that checked with his other neighbouring racehorse breeders and found that the ones that were within five miles of a frac site were experiencing these difficulties with jaw alignment and difficulties in breathing in the foals. And because, <coughs> unlike human babies, racehorses are worth fortune. So that mattered. That got the press. And then finally Rolling Stone magazine put the Utah midwife <coughs> on cover. And it was raised up as alarm. And I think that because it impacts so directly women's health, um, that it was always going to be a certainty that we'd come to the realisation first. When we first started and we discovered this, um, we started doing public meetings across the country, and I ended up calling the public meetings the unwelcome gift of truth because it's ghastly. Because once you know this threat to your children, you are no longer making a decision to be an activist. You actually have no choice. This is an obligation that you are a mother or a grandmother or an aunt or you care for children then it is now an obligation. And there is no outdoor. Every outdoor has my granddaughter's face on it. So if I want to leave, I can't. And so thus seven years in. Um, and when we were doing these meetings, I realised also it was very strange that I'd walk into a room and whether it was six people or you know, 300 in all the towns that we visited that had licences, that the room would sort of start off a bit like that. And, and most men stayed like that for about three minutes longer than the women did. The women were very quickly, instantly tuned into it. I, I don't know whether it is. I, I heard someone describe it, it was on one of the faith days, that women are the environment. You know, everything that's born, every human born is born of woman, and we are the environment in which those children grow. And thus, if we can sense something, you know, London air is not good for our kids, we can feel it in ourselves when we breathe it. And I think that when you're near a frack site, you become very aware. And I think in Australia as well, the stories that came out of there, and I went to the Paris Climate Talks, and Friends of the Earth brought together 150 um, parents from um, gas fields in America, Australia, Canada, and put them in a room with us who weren't yet living in a gas field. And they told us their stories. Now, you can give me as many paid-for government reports as you like when another mother looks you in the eye and cries because when she put her child in the bath, there were chemical burns. And it wasn't that the bath was hot, the children were chemical burned. It was a very sad story of a gentleman called... Um, George Bender, which is a tragic tale to read, but he had the same experience where he put his grandchildren in the bath and he ended up taking his own life sometime later because he willingly signed the lease and um, hadn't realised what he was signing up for. 
there's um, an amusing anecdote after all that, uh, which is in America when they come to, to ask you if they can use their land to drill on, they come and they have a, the man who comes is called a landsman, and the landsman has a manual, and one day a landsman dropped a manual, mm -hmm. and that ended up in our anti-fracking movement, which is very mm -hmm. handy. First line, first page. If the wife is home, leave. <laughs> it was, she will ask you too many questions. No offence to the gentleman in the room. And if this isn't a reflection on you, this is just what the Lanson's Manual says, is that men like to act as if they know as much, if not more, than you. <laughs> Women will never be left in the dark and will pick and pick, and pick <coughs> until they get to the truth of this. So leave. And when you're alone with the man, tell him, surely it's his decision. Surely it's the man of the house, it's his decision. And that was how they wangled this. Wow. Yeah, because I don't think there's a woman that would do your... Because I think we're so used to milk moustaches on the kids. You can spot a lie ten miles off. Can't you? You never look on tell me another one. So um, there's a very different approach. The thing, one of the things that's surprising most is a female coming to activism seven years ago from a perfectly normal, sold-out, capitalist lifestyle um, to then coming to this, is that um, activism is a strange place to find yourself especially when it's obliged activism, it's not choice activism. Yes, I disagree with war and student debt and the NHS cutbacks and so on. And we can choose to get involved in those. With this one, as I say, once you know, you can't unknow. And therefore you feel um, imminently threatened, as we are in the United Kingdom, that you can't leave. But you come to activism, and Obi, I met um, on my very first ever activism, which I went down to the Occupy movement. And I was trying to learn how to be an activist. <laughs> And I, I didn't know what the job involved. And there was no job description. And there were very strong men doing strong things. And there were strong-spoken women too. And then when we got to the camps to stop the fracking, um, the first thing you do is direct actions and so on. And I wasn't really that person. I didn't know how to be that person or to have my own sense of worth within a movement where I didn't feel I had the key skills, strength or stamina to do the tough stuff. And you spend a lot of time feeling inadequate to the task. Um, until um, someone made me speak about it and I discovered that a room might listen. And then I found a different role mm. within it. And I've seen that happen time and again to such a sense of satisfaction that there's a woman on the retirement park next to where we have our activist hub, where we all meet to eat and things and to get together. And at the height of our summer operation, she came to us. She was in her 90s and her best friend who was, I don't know, someone in her 70s or something, and was a little bit, had eaten too much recently and was on a diet and was <laughs> doing Slimmer's World, and said that she was in terrible trouble because she keeps gaining weight, um, because her friend's husband had died about a decade before, and she'd had to eat all the cakes that this woman still kept insisting on baking. <laughs> and would there be anybody who'd have any use for that? <laughs> At which point a line of the strong young men who'd just been on top of trucks for a hundred hours and everybody else who was there piled in and went, oh... That's good. And this woman who hadn't had gratitude, perhaps, for a long time, found her sense of worth and place within a movement. And that suddenly, instead of being a burden on society that you're made to feel when you are no longer young enough, pretty enough, or childbearing enough, mm -hmm. these women of a certain age suddenly found their worth and use within it. Right now, as I'm here, I know Mary Doig in her late 70s, early 80s, has been sat for weeks sewing sashes, like um, suffragette sashes. Because that's what she does well. And she can't jump on a truck or lock on. Although I know plenty of women who do. We also have a great deal of use. And I know it sounds terrible. But um, quite often we utilise the women within the movement. Particularly the older ones with sticks or in wheelchairs. Because no one will slow walk a truck better. Than perhaps <laughs> Anne Power with her walking stick. Because she's slow. <laughs> and we found that also we have different talents. And that's where I find now that I relish what we gift activism, because activism was, it existed always. Um, but now I see that there's this swathes of everyday people had to come to this, because no, they didn't have student debt, and yes, they cared about the NHS, but maybe not enough to get up. But they had a need for air and water, and this is what's going to be directly impacted by fracking. So consequently, people found um, that they had to be in this movement, and they had to find different ways to be in it. And we also find, I think, that we can sometimes soften some of the worst situations. I remember being on Barton Moss, and it was appalling. It was one of the worst uh, for police violence and for the discomfort on a sexual level 
um, that the police would butt in behind you as you were slow walking, the police line would be too close to you and it would feel terribly uncomfortable that they were that close into your body. And so I started to turn around in the line and link arms with the ladies but walk backwards and keep guarding and going, you're touching that woman's ass. <laughs> She's 80, for God's sake. <laughs> and then uh, I got a pair of mirrored sunglasses so that the six foot four cop who was bearing down on me with steroid neck I'm going, did your mother like that face? Did she think that face is a nice face? Is this what you thought you'd look like at work this morning? <laughs> and to shame and make them feel discomfort, as I think only sometimes an older generation of women does so well. Mm -hmm. And to say things like, I'd be careful with Anne, her bag is full. If you touch her, it will go all over you. She has a colossal, but she doesn't. <laughs> or that Mary has a brittle bone, and should you touch her, she will shatter like glass. I'm like, oh, where can we touch them? <laughs> So you have gifts that you can bring, and I think mm. it changed. I've seen the face of activism change in interesting ways because of the influx of more women and because of the influx of more non-activists who come to this out of an obligation. And I think we gift it a great deal, and I think we are so honoured by the men we stand behind, beside. I can honestly have that many that I don't find respectful, <coughs> but the vast majority, when you think about the people we stand with at the side of the road, you know, Yellow and everyone else, I feel honoured in their company, I don't feel like they act as if they need to protect me, I feel as if they respect the way I do my activism. It's not always like that, some of them, I remember <clears throat> day three or four, we've been at the roadside on this particular site for about 460 days now, and it must have been about day three or four, and I saw a post on Facebook by a particularly alpha male, and he said, it's all right, Tina, don't worry, love. Boys are going to come and show you how it's done. <clears throat> I'm, in, I'm in the middle of working a guy who works on the site. And so far I've got out of him who the next cement supplier is. And I know if I stand there long enough, I'll be able to work it. One of the cops said to me one day, he said, you're blogging every night and they're really long, your blogs. I said, why read my blog? Don't read it. He said, no, I have to. It's my job. I have to read your blog every night. So I blogged for the first hundred days. So, all right, anyway, sometime later in conversation, um, he mentioned that his wife was pregnant. You tell me once. So then I started. Mm. And I started speaking to the cops through my blogs. He came up to me about a week later. Well, thanks very much. <laughs> I have had to sit through gas lands, fracking hell. He said, I don't even read your blog anymore. And my wife reads it at bedtime to me. <laughs> <laughs> he's just left the street because he's now found it impossible to continue policing us. Excellent. Because he understands. And they all did after over a year together. And that's the other thing, you know, we've, we've become a community at the side of the road that is there and fighting. And the police were really most brutal in the summer when they deliberately brought us in what they call mutual aid policing, which means they don't know your community, they don't know you, and they just don't care about you. And I understand from the police as well, there was a saying, and it was called free kicks, which is, if they're policing in a town that isn't theirs and any harm happens, doesn't matter. It doesn't impact you or your station. It will fall into the area that you're in. And so consequently it got violent and it got wild. And that was when we got together and we said, and this is 32 Wednesdays ago, we decided we'd have um, an action that was designed as a call for calm. And it would be a women's action and we would wear white and we would have a 15 minute silence at the gates. And the reason for it was that I was found in myself that I couldn't go on, that every day was so violent and so awful and so aggressive and so abstract to what my life is, and that your natural inclination is to see aggression and walk away. But when you see aggression and, it's, and the police and the law is protecting the thing that will harm your children, you are in a quagmire as to where to go and what to do. So we called this and we started working it so that every Wednesday we gathered, we were white, we went up to the gates and there would be a police line and for 15 minutes we would have a silence and there was a female police officer and one of the women gave her a rose and she cried and the male officers found it incredibly uncomfortable to have a line of women in front of them and didn't know where to look and would look away. They've literally been replaced partly through finance and also because none of them want to do it, with a thin blue line now, so we don't have anyone to stand again. So. <laughs> but we don't mind, we still do it. But I remember on one day in particular realising um, that it was an unsettling change for the police to know what to do with it, when one of them was a hedge cutter across the road during the 15-minute silence, and the policeman walked over and went, shh, 
they're doing silence. And I remember the, <laughs> I remember the security guards who we're usually at war with on the other side. I thought, if I was you, though, I'd put my radio on, I'd be chatting. I wouldn't be being respect, and yet they were. It was strange that it commanded that. But we did say that we, we were there <coughs> acting as the absent mothers and grandmothers of everyone on that road who was caught up in a violent turmoil. That this every Wednesday was a reset point where we would stop, go quiet, and then we would have a reset point and move on from that. And then you can build your week's aggression again. But on Wednesdays, I put it down. On Wednesdays, I put it down. And I try to think, okay, everything that happened last week is done. And now we start the week afresh, much like you do with your kids when they're being bad. And so that's how we do, we utilize the women on Wednesdays. Now, the side effect <laughs> of this little action is for three hours, they don't let any trucks in. It wasn't the plan. I mean, we could have done a three-hour blockade, and that would have been fought every step of the way by the cops. Mm -hmm. But instead, we get an accidental three hours of not. And the, you know, the other day... Because <laughs> we wear white and we all have a particular behaviour on Wednesdays that isn't like any other day. And um, they had ran a truck in 20 minutes early. And I instantly tore my skirt off. I mean, underneath I was fully dressed. And so I took my white skirt off. As the police officer came up to me and went, oh, what happened? I was like, 20 minutes early with the truck. <laughs> and I am no longer in white now. And he said, oh, I never realised. And I thought, wow, it's a bit strange. But I think it's sometimes in life, like in activism... Things go along in a predictable manner, and the police like that. They like a little bit of violence back, they can use violence to you. They like to know what's happening. And the second you change the tune, it's like banging the record. They're not quite sure, they're a little bit confused by it, and, and, and it's something that they are unsettled by. But there's also, if there's a female inspector that's on on Wednesdays who I think kind of gets what we do and why we do it, mm. because in the end she's still female, she's still... Can see what we're doing. Know, what is it you're dif What is actually happening on your street? <laughs> oh, Preston New Road. Actually, sorry, you haven't yeah. described what you're trying to say. Oh, okay. <laughs> so Preston New Road. We, 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 there's been countless cats and sites yeah. across the country. Preston New Road is where a frack site on January fifth last year they arrived. Um, they'd overturned our local government's mm -hmm. rejection of planning. Westminster said that it was a decision too big for the north, and they would make it for us, which was really useful, really, because anybody who didn't give a damn about fracking. Did give a damn about democracy and came on side. Mm. And uh, so we've been there since January 5th, every single working actually, day. They've not actually started fracking. They've drilled. They've drilled. They're nine months behind schedule. And we've done some other very useful things, which was taking out suppliers, contacting them, uh, making sure, thanks to the inside information, that we blockaded particularly cement trucks because the cement went off, and then found mm. out who the next supplier was due to be and contacted them in advance. Eddie Stobart's pulled out of supply and frack sites as a result of the intimidation. <clears throat> Not intimidation. It was a friendly call. And we did mention <laughs> that if you didn't think it was a good idea to pull out, then we might have to get in the way of a few trucks, even if they weren't going for fracking. It was just the company in general. Um, so they pulled out. So there was quite... Um, so, But we've been there still, and they are now turning the drill sideways for the horizontal. Mm -hmm. They were originally planning to start fracking in the second quarter, April to July. Um, but they've just put out their annual, their quarterly report and said, we'll be fracking in the third quarter. So again, they are delaying. We halved the share price by taking out the suppliers and by incredible delays. Currently now, they're, they're fighting Lancashire weather, which was always a, a big beast of a thing to fight on a frack pad that was forever sodden. Um, so we're currently, I would say, sort of winning. We're still, yeah, we are winning in the sense that they're not yeah. fracking yet. It's also the first site that's ever been on a main road like this one. It's, it's literally, yeah. it's on a main road. There's Blackpool on one side and there's Preston on the other, and it's on a dual carriageway that's on a main road. So it is really, really difficult to do any kind of process when you've got, it's a main ambulance route, so you've got to take that into consideration. Um, yeah, so it is, it's massively dangerous as well doing yeah. it. But then when it opens, well, you'll have yeah. water going into it and gas going out by truck. Yeah. Exactly. You'll, have, you'll have a constant um, mm -hmm. road traffic from the site um, that will We're hopeful. disrupt all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, there's, uh, there's lots of um, like HGV trucks going in and mm -hmm. out, and obviously the site generators that they use are run on diesel. Yeah. And if there's massive research into diesel and diesel particles and then being carcinogenic, so obviously that's a massive worry as well. Um, yeah, it's been, it has been a bit of a mad protest, hasn't it? <laughs> because we know that like every ambulance on that road, it means you're like eight minutes from death. That's a blue light road. Yeah. Right. So to blockade a road, and again we had that in the early days, didn't we, where, where some of the stronger activists were, just went into to normal mode as to what we do in a frack site, which is blockade the road. 
but usually they're on back streets and lanes and things where you can blockade. But as Els just said, <clears throat> and also you have to look at what are the gains to this as well. Where do we win? Well, I hang out with Elle and Maureen. Elle is, I'd say, I want to say a hardline activist because you know what you're doing. You'll do a direct action and you are completely on that side as far as I'm concerned. And then we have Maureen, counsellor, had to learn activism, but you still do your activism in council chambers and at meetings and in law courts, but at the side of the road with us. So we've all got different skills we've brought to this, but it's united some of the most amazing people where we've cross-skilled and, and we scare the hell out of the industry when we get together because they were expecting, they kept trying to say there's the out-of-towners and the locals. So Elle's an out-of-town, a scary activist, or as Maureen's a lovely local, lovely local, you wouldn't upset Maureen. So they tried to divide us, didn't mm -hmm. they? And the more they tried, the closer we all got. Mm -hmm. So I would say we're currently, seven years now we've heard them say, we'll be fracking next year, we'll be fracking next year. And in seven years, and Quadrilla spends 17 million a year without producing a drop of gas. So yeah, we're winning, we're doing well, but we are a crunch point now, absolute crunch point. And for us, I think the hardest thing we have is having defended this site for so long is to see the rig when every morning you get up and you go to the roadside and the rig is there, it's like someone stabs you. Mm. It's just horrific and it's sad and it's <coughs> tragic and it takes its toll on your family time and your own life. But the gains, I think, will always, always be worth it. I'd still rather have done all this and lost all the things I lost than not done it because it's been an amazing journey. Thank you. <laughs>